China. Once a weak and impoverished country, has undergone a tremendous transformation rarely seen in human history. It's reinvigorating itself, re-emerging as a major economic powerhouse. It's also opening up and interacting with the world like never before. What has happened since the People's Republic of China was founded in 1949? How has the country engaged with the world in the last 70 years? This five-episode documentary retraces the path China has taken, examining how it has impacted and has been impacted by the world. The first episode focuses on people-to-people -people exchanges. In the early days of the People's Republic of China, the country was, for the most part, secluded from the outside. Few Chinese had the privilege to go abroad. Today, with more wealth and freedom of mobility, more and more Chinese are able to travel abroad, making nearly 150 million trips overseas in 2018. In the meantime, China's development has attracted massive inflows of foreign visitors as well. This is Beijing Capital International, the busiest airport in Asia. With a plane taking off or landing every 50 seconds on average, it's a major point of contact between China and the rest of the world. It operates like a finely tuned machine, ensuring that more than 100 million people a year fly to and from every corner of the world for holidays, business meetings, family visits and all manner of other reasons. Built in 1958, it was one of the first international airports in China. Prior to 1978, when China adopted the policy of reform and opening up, the airport was used mainly by official delegations on their way either from or to China, and by a few privileged individuals. When I first started working here, there were very few travelers and flights at Terminal 1. That was back in 1980 when Terminal 1 first opened. But it didn't take long for the number of travelers to rise exponentially. Visitor volume in all the buildings exceeded our design capacity. I felt like the place was suddenly full. It was so crowded that four people needed to be squeezed in one square meter of space. The expansion of the capital airport has been in a neck-and-neck -neck race with the increase of travelers. Terminal 2 was finished in 1995 and Terminal 3, which started operation in 2008, has six times the capacity of Terminal 1 and is equipped with the most cutting-edge infrastructure. It is very modern, not only in terms of architecture, but also in operation and philosophies. I remember there were only two conveyor belts at T1, and they relied on people to sort suitcases. In contrast, the conveyor belt system of Terminal 3 is an intricate system 64 kilometers long, with suitcases moving at a top speed of more than 40 kilometers per hour. The computerized system sorts and transports 19,200 suitcases an hour. In 2018, visitor volume at the capital airport reached over 100 million. Over the past 40 years, the airport's annual passenger handling capacity has increased more than a hundredfold. As China's reform and opening up deepened, more and more people are crossing the border. The number has been growing at 8% on average annually and has reached 650 million people by 2018. It was 115 times more than at the beginning of the reform and opening up policy. Today, the increase of wealth of the Chinese means that more and more of them now have the capacity, the will and the freedom to travel across borders. In the bustling heart of Singapore, you can see something that's become commonplace in shopping centers and tourist spots the world over. Chinese shoppers. 
50 years ago, an overseas holiday was unimaginable for the majority of Chinese people. In 2018, nearly 150 million of them travel abroad. They spent 277.3 billion US dollars on buying everything from local delicacies to luxury handbags. Chinese travelers have become a major contributor to the global tourism industry. Chinese customer is one of our top nationalities for our network. Yeah, so their buying power is quite strong. Every year you get all the China tourists coming in, Chinese New Year and July, August. And those are my biggest customers. I, I found out through the years that the Chinese market constitute the biggest. Uh, it's the way, it's the purchasing power, the way they buy. It's huge, huge. Uh, they buy by bags and whatever. Uh, I think they constitute about maybe 60% of my business. A tourist group from China alights from their bus and starts shopping. And so another busy day begins for the shopkeepers. Most stores display signs in Chinese, and an increasing number of them have adopted an innovation that directly caters to their Chinese customers, mobile payment. In recent years, Alibaba and other companies in China have been promoting money transfers via mobile phone. And now, Chinese people are taking their cashless habit everywhere they go. Because uh, we're adopting uh, Alipay in 2017. Yeah, because China, they, uh, they prefer cashless. So they, they don't even have cash. <laughs> Locals like Michael Lee have sensed a major opportunity. His company, S-Cash, is working with China's Alibaba to promote mobile payment across Singapore's commercial sector. The industry calls people like Lee QR code planters since most mobile payments are completed by swiping a QR code. Because of the um, rising um, China tourists outside China, yeah. people are start to looking for good and efficient technology to capture this tourist money. As, as more and more merchants adopt this technology, they realize they have more business than before. In fact, some merchants um, even told us that their sales increased by at least 50% ever since they adopt because now they have a new, new, new stream of customer. Very good. I'm very happy. How's, I, I see the business has been uh, doing very well. Yes, ever since you gave me this this machine. Uh -huh. Oh, very fun. <laughs> uh -huh. Very good, very good. It's a money sucking machine, man. Uh, money sucking machine. It's definitely a necessity. Uh, everyone from China, the younger generations, come in and use Alipay like part of the way of life. It's their way of life. And if you don't have it, you, you are not part of their way of life. Simple as that. He now has over a thousand clients in Singapore. Mobile payment is still a relative novelty here, and Lee is working hard to convince shop owners to adopt the technology. But he believes others will soon come on board as more and more Chinese tourists arrive. From 1995 to 2018, the number of Chinese outbound travelers grew by 17% a year on average, and it's been the biggest outbound travel market since 2014. The miracle of the Chinese economy started with the flow of human capital. In the 21st century, China's highly efficient air routes, railways and roads have developed into a vast network of arteries serving the country's fast-moving economy. The country has come a long way. In the first three decades after the People's Republic was founded in 1949, such easy movement of people and resources was scarcely imaginable. Before the reform and opening up, China had a highly centralized, planned economy. The flow of skills and labor between cities and rural areas was strictly controlled. Such restrictions were considered necessary in order to keep rural people in the fields to guarantee food production and to protect jobs in the cities. 
It was called a dual economy or a dual social structure between cities and villages. The system restricted the flow of people between cities and rural areas. In 1978, China ushered in a new era of reform and opening up, with senior leader Deng Xiaoping as the chief architect. One of Deng's most profoundly influential decisions was to introduce the market economy into the socialist system. Fueled by market forces and competition, private businesses sprang up even as state-owned enterprises were undergoing reform. What followed was an increasing flow of capital, people and resources between rural and urban China and among cities. And the rest is history. China's economy began to see double-digit growth. By the 1990s, the country was being called the world's factory. Millions of people from poor villages took advantage of the opportunity to leave their hometowns to find better paid jobs and a higher standard of living in the big cities. When the PRC was founded in 1949, the country's urbanization rate was little more than 10%. Now the rate is close to 60%. Where have all the new urban residents come from, from the countryside? Since the reform and opening up, 25 to 30% of new productivity has been created by this new workforce. The money these migrant workers sent home boosted economic growth in China's least developed areas. At the same time, the government invested heavily in high-quality roads, guaranteeing access even for people in remote regions where the terrain was challenging. By the end of 2018, the country had 4.8 million kilometers of roads, reaching over 95% of all rural villages. This gave rural residents the opportunity to move freely around the country. China was able to leave 800 million people out of poverty in the last four decades, uh, largely due to the migrant uh, people moving also uh, from rural areas to the cities. It's hard to imagine, but 40 years ago, many of China's modern cities were nothing more than small county towns. China's economic prosperity of today has been driven in part by the flow of skills and resources around the country. This process has created new cities and expanded old ones. Increased wealth and improved education levels have given rise to a burgeoning middle class 400 million strong. Experts predict that a further 800 million people will join its ranks in the next 10 to 15 years. From 70 US dollars in 1962 to $9,470 in 2018, the gross national income of Chinese people rose more than 130 times. College students now, they can move around the country. They, they can migrate around the country. For example, uh, young people go to Shenzhen, go to Guangzhou, go to Shanghai, uh, Chengdu. And so the first tier, second tier cities in China largely composed of the young people, migrant from colleges, from different uh, universities in China. So they have actually powered uh, China's uh, uh, development of uh, science and technology and also um, R&D and, and all the other areas. The younger generation of China have embraced a lifestyle that's vastly different from that experienced by their parents and grandparents. As the new generation more actively engage with the world, they're bringing about a radical change in the country's relationship with the rest of the global community. But of course, the presence of Chinese people overseas far predates the tourism surge. In the early 20th century, people from the southern and southeastern provinces of China, such as Guangdong and Fujian, left by boat and settled in many countries. There, they established Chinatowns and made a living running barber shops and restaurants and by working in labor-intensive jobs like construction. In 
recent years, as China's economy has grown and its trade and commercial relations with the world have deepened, and as more Chinese companies have expanded into other markets, so a number of highly educated Chinese professionals have made their way overseas. Wherever they've gone, they've contributed to the local economy, although in very different ways compared to their predecessors a century ago. This is Tembisa, a 42 square kilometer low income district of Johannesburg in South Africa. This area with its 460,000 inhabitants represents a complete contrast with the modern urban center of the city, which was built on gold mining. With internet access being relatively expensive in South Africa, television remains the main source of entertainment. Tembisa's rooftops are covered with satellite dishes despite the high subscription costs eating up a large part of family incomes. These orange receivers are new in Tembisa. The Chinese company that provides them, Star Times, offers installation and subscription fees that are more affordable to the local people. We will use our influence to tell the story of uh, African people, tell the story of uh, Chinese people, and tell the story between China and Africa. Star Times is one of several newcomers to the South African TV market. Its arrival has increased competition, and over the past five years, average cost to the consumer has fallen. Today, Star Times has more than 200,000 registered users across South Africa. And also, we um, um, recently launched a new product called the um, Solar Home System. African families even they live in the, in the area without um, electricity access. They can use this product to watch TV by the solar power. At the 2015 Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, China pledged to bring satellite TV to 10,000 African villages. Star Times is one of the companies carrying out that mission. Yan Chiong leads a team of Chinese and South African professionals. Cross-cultural management is a daily challenge. Part of Yan's mission is to reach across barriers. While ordinary Chinese people are only just starting to venture out into the world, the country's major cities like Beijing and Shanghai have long been playing host to international visitors. As China rapidly industrialized and its consumer market expanded, an increasing number of multinational corporations began using these cities as gateways onto the Chinese market. The Lujiazue area of Shanghai is now home to over 600 regional headquarters of foreign companies. Meanwhile, more than 100,000 foreign merchants are operating in the city of Yiwu in Zhejiang province, purchasing small commodities. Yet, experts say there's still considerable room for the number of foreigners working in China to grow. The percentage of foreigners living and working in China is less than 1%. That's compared to the 3% international average, 10% in developed countries, and 1.6% across developing countries. I think it's very useful to have um, a certain percentage of foreign population in, in your country. Uh, they bring new ideas, new methods of working, um, and, and can, re can really help in, in terms of um, stimulating the economy or culture and other things. So that kind of mix can be very vibrant in, in a country. Gilbert van Kerkhove is originally from Belgium. He was one of the first foreigners to come to China immediately after the introduction of the reform and opening up. My story started in 1980 when I first came to China. The reason I came to China was for a job. I was asked to take care of a project in Henan, Pindingshan, a big power plant that was the first soft loan granted to China. 
So when I came to China, I basically had no idea what was China. Van Kerkhove didn't plan to stay for long, but by the time he had completed his assignment, he had changed his mind and decided to settle in China. So the changes over these 40 years were really tremendous. If you go back in time, I look at my old pictures of 40 years ago, 35 years ago, you compare to today, it's a different country, a different planet, so to speak. So I felt, yes, uh, I had to stay here because things were happening here and there was a potential for development in this country. In this respect, uh, I'm right. I'm here. This was uh, also for the China Friendship Award in the Great Hall of the People. He runs so his own was, consulting company. Happy. One of his clients was the and Beijing was Municipal Government during the preparations the for the Olympic 2008 Sports Olympics. His work has earned him a Chinese green card and several awards, including the Great Wall Friendship Award and the Shanghai Magnolia Prize for Distinguished Expats. Is uh, the Friendship Award. People ask me many times, Gilbert, how can you stay so long time in China? 40 years. You like China? You love it? You become Chinese? I always say, I'm a Flemish and Belgium. I'm European, but because I feel home in Beijing. My life is here, my friends are here, foreign friends, Chinese friends. I'm in China, this is my home. International cooperation is needed in combating global threats such as climate change, terrorism and health crises. Experts at the Institute Pasteur of Shanghai have been working hard to find solutions to fight infectious diseases. French national Fernando Aranzana Seisdedos is the co-director of this institute. International uh, cooperation and research cannot be split apart. These two concepts are naturally linked there is no room to perform research outside the large international community. The Institute Pasteur of Shanghai is a non-profit organization jointly established by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the Institute Pasteur in France and the Shanghai Municipal Government. Its international team of experts address public health issues in China. We have biologists from around 12 countries worldwide, foreign researchers and graduate students account for close to 20% of our staff. We plan to raise this percentage to 30 to 40% in the next five years. I don't remember which one was better, but I think one was better. So here. Researchers are checking on the experiment results. If the cells are indeed infected with the virus, they will have white marks. These kinds of inspections can help fight viruses effectively. Among the existing staff is researcher Dimitri Laviette. He chose to carry out his virology studies at the Institute because of the high standard of its research infrastructure. He's impressed by the great strides China has taken in fighting epidemics. For example, one example is Zika outbreak in my field. Uh, so Zika virus has just emerged recently. And so the government need to give a lot of money to help research to go fast. China reacted very, very fast and they were able to really compete with the with US. They were able to compete easily with Europe that was maybe slow, more slow. So yeah, this is just to show that there is a very big dynamic in China and this is really one of the main quality we have in China. The, everything is going fast. Although he has spent five years of his life in Shanghai, Dimitri still has a preference for French food. 
Luckily, he can easily find cuisines from all corners of the world in Shanghai. Shanghai is one of the most cosmopolitan cities in China, where many global citizens have found a reason to settle. As people-to-people -people interactions become more frequent between China and the rest of the world, the number of foreigners living and working in China has been rising at an ever quicker pace. In response to the trend, China set up the National Immigration Administration in April 2018. The array of new policies and measures that rolled out has provided convenience to that community and served to attract more talents to China. As our country improved its governance capacity and expanded its influence, more and more foreigners are coming to live and work in China. This has raised new requirements for immigration services. Launching the National Immigration Administration is China's effort to up its governance capacity and promote modernization. This will help the government better serve the people's need for a better life, better protect the sovereignty, safety and interest of the country, promote friendly exchanges between China and the world, build a global community of shared destiny and push for reforms in the global governance system. The winner, just for the debate purpose, because it was a stronger debate, patriarchy. Tyler Rorick is an American who's been working at New York University Shanghai for two years. Before that, from 2013, he studied as part of the inaugural class at what was NYU's new campus in China. And when I was looking to study in college, I was looking for the opportunity to go abroad and see the world. And so I naturally fell upon NYU. And during that year, I found out they were gonna be opening a new university in Shanghai, China. And so it was an opportunity I leapt for and I successfully landed on. And it's, it's been an amazing opportunity. After graduating in 2017, he remained at NYU Shanghai as a coordinator for its new student program. At the time, it was virtually impossible for foreigners with no work experience to secure a work permit in China. But then, he saw an opportunity in Shanghai's new policy to ease requirements for fresh graduates. And so I remember the HR of NYU Shanghai saying, it's a new process, there might be some bumps, there might be some challenges, but let's try. In the conversation, and if they can talk about it without you, oh my god. And so, he became the first fresh foreign graduate to receive a work permit in China. Even though I'm leaving China to go work back in the United States, I don't think my connection with NYU Shanghai or with China is done. Rorick and his team of student volunteers are preparing for the new undergraduate intake of 2019. New York University Shanghai represents a growing trend in China, that of higher education becoming more internationally oriented. China, once a weak and impoverished country, has undergone a tremendous transformation rarely seen in human history. It's reinvigorating itself, re-emerging as a major economic powerhouse. It's also opening up and interacting with the world like never before. What has happened since the People's Republic of China was founded in 1949? How has the country engaged with the world in the last 70 years? This five-episode documentary retraces the path China has taken, examining how it has impacted and has been impacted by the world.
。今天，来自全球一百多个国家的同学们相聚在这里。Thousands of new students have gathered for a ceremony marking the start of the new school year. Among them is a significant number of international students. They've been drawn here by Tsinghua's reputation for academic excellence. In the 2020 Times Higher Education World University ranking, Tsinghua was first in Asia and 23rd in the world. Back in the 1950s, it was one of the first universities on the Chinese mainland to accept foreign students. However, prior to the reform and opening up, international students in China were not only small in number, but also mostly part of government exchange programs. Today, they're here in large numbers, and the majority are self-financed. In 2018, we had 3,785 international students. The figure increased by 72% between 2007 to 2017. Lawrence Kowalski comes from Poland. He's one of this year's new student intake for the computer science graduate program. Discovered a passion for this country as well, and、uh, learning more about how. Uh, the Eastern culture and the Western culture differ, and how they are similar, and how we can、uh, sort of work together to,、uh, to 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 collaborate despite these differences. And、uh, that's why I、uh, eventually decided to actually move here、uh, for the long term as well. Before coming to Tsinghua, he was an investment banker with a degree in mathematics from Oxford University in the UK. During a visit to China. He was impressed by the country's dynamism, the rapidly maturing business environment, and especially the momentum being generated by its new high-tech industries.、Uh, so, artificial intelligence, and in particular, applications of machine learning in、uh, medical science, which for me is extremely interesting. Ivana Todorovic comes from Bosnia and Herzegovina, and she's here to study public health. This is the first time she's set foot in China. Because I know that this is one of the prestigious university、uh, in China, Asia, and the world,、uh, because it's very famous and、uh, in the world because of its、uh, excellence and、uh, academic achievements. One of the first things she did after arriving at Tsinghua was to visit its AIDS research center. She says she's particularly excited by the university's academic infrastructure. As model, you know, firstly it was vaccinated by this our vaccine design. When I, I arrive in my country,、uh, I will help my university to、uh, form master program of public health, and that, that is how I will start working in my country and、uh, improving health system of my of my country. This is the annual international culture festival at Tsinghua. Scenes like this. Are becoming commonplace at universities across China. In 2018, nearly half a million international students came to China, more than half of whom applied for degrees, including 60,000 master students and 25,000 PhD students. The number of foreign students in China is growing. On the other hand, over 600,000 Chinese students are now going overseas to study each year, a testament to the increasing wealth of many Chinese families. This phenomenon dates from 1978. Since then, China has sent over six million students overseas, including postgraduates, high school students, and visiting scholars. The number is thought to reach seven or eight million. The tide of studying overseas was initiated by the reform and opening up policy in 1978. It started with a group of 50 scholars. They were professors and researchers in engineering, automation, physics, and maths. That year, they flew to the United States as visiting scholars. They were led by 45-year-old Liu Baicheng. I was in the mechanical engineering department in the summer of 1978. Out of the blue, the department director told me a team of scholars. Would soon be sent to the U.S. The university had a quota of ten people, and one person from our department could go. Deng Xiaoping proposed to increase the number of Chinese students overseas. In his words, not by dozens, but tens of thousands, to improve China's science and education levels. 
Doug also said the government should allow these students to homestay. That remark was made on June the 23rd, 1978 at Tsinghua University. Leo was practicing his English speaking skills prior to his departure when he received an urgent call. I got a call telling me to get ready right away. We'd be leaving ahead of schedule. Why? Because China and the US had issued a joint communique and would be establishing formal diplomatic relations in January 1979. Deng Xiaoping was about to visit the US and they wanted to get us there early to help create a friendly atmosphere. However, in the Cold War climate, the political relationship between China and the US was highly sensitive. So They said, even if you're chosen to go to America, you're not considered out of the country unless you step on the plane. If any diplomatic incident happens, you wouldn't be able to go. The group of scholars did make it to the US. Leo spent two years at the University of Wisconsin and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he had access to the most advanced experimental equipment available at the time. But his most surprising discovery was not made inside the laboratory. It was made at the American home where he was staying. I opened the door and saw this eight-year-old boy playing with a Mac computer. I'd never seen a computer before, as our department at Tsinghua didn't have one. It occurred to me that this machine could transform human existence. And that's what's happened. Anyway, I decided to study computing. Upon his return to China, he used computer simulation to push forward the boundaries of his academic discipline, casting. His trip to the US had set Leo on a new career path. Like him, numerous Chinese students over the years have experienced a career-defining impact from studying overseas. In the past, the majority of the Chinese studying overseas were sponsored by the government. Most were sent to learn subjects related to engineering and science at a time when the country was in desperate need of such skills as it strove to industrialize. Today, young people are studying a wide range of subjects overseas, from international relations to business and media. 95% of them are self-financed, contributing a sizable portion of the revenue of major universities worldwide. The 660,000 Chinese nationals who now go and study abroad each year account for about 40% of the international student population globally. West London is the home of the UK headquarters of many companies. It's a place where go-getters thrive, and Kiki Wang from China has just joined their ranks. She recently graduated from Sheffield University with a degree in media studies. She's landed a job as a producer with the Anglo-Chinese television production company, Propeller TV. I loved watching documentaries from BBC or other British TV channels. And I loved studying English as well. So uh, going out to study abroad was always my dream. Talented young people from China, like Kiki, are becoming a bigger part of the international workforce of many companies. As young professionals, they're learning the skills needed to operate across cultures. When she's off duty, Kiki sometimes travels back from London to Sheffield, the place where she planned her future with her professors and classmates, the place where her dreams began. Hi, Jesse. It's been so long. Good. Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you again. So this is some of the new stuff they did. They call them features, but it's like three to four minutes. Yeah, okay. It's like, it's you know that film? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Did you watch it? <laughs> I haven't watched it yet, but I'm reading his, uh, his, his first book. Yeah. Uh, In the next few years, I would love to travel between China and the UK a lot to see what can be done. 
in terms of um, production or documentary or even some cultural events to help the people in both countries to understand each other better and to know more about each other country's culture. Experts say that talented young Chinese people with international experience are invaluable in the age of globalization. Patrick Liu can be considered one such person. He is the China head of Neuberger Berman, a US-based asset management firm. Born and raised in the cosmopolitan city of Shanghai, he demonstrated an interest in Western culture at an early age. I was quite interested in Western things, even when I was very young, but I was born in the 1970s, so I had to wait until later in life to have access to these things. So naturally, it made me want to travel outside the country. He turned this interest into action. He lived, studied and worked in the UK, eventually embarking on a career in finance. Naturally, I thought about getting an education overseas so as to learn more about the culture. Then, after I graduated, I could earn a salary 10 to 15 times more than in China. Exposed to London's sophisticated financial practices at a time when China's own financial markets were still at the early stage of development, he built up vital expertise. This would later prove a major draw for multinational financial institutions looking for experts with a Chinese background to lead their business into the expanding Chinese market. This is what Leo has been doing for the past three years. In 2017, China opened its asset management sector to foreign players. Subsequently, many global firms have set up wholly foreign-owned enterprises in China. More than 30 of them, including the one that Liu helped launch, are located in Shanghai's iconic Lu Jiazui district. Among his responsibilities is liaising between China's stock regulators and the company's US headquarters. This means a busy travel schedule flying in and out of the country. Leo is hardly alone living constantly on the move, with more and more multinational companies and institutions operating in China. Among the 46 million people who travel in and out of China through Shanghai every year, a large number are doing so on business. Today, overseas visitors are finding it easier to access Shanghai. People from 53 countries are entitled to take advantage of the 144-hour visa exemption transit policy. Transit passengers whose final destination is a third country or region are allowed to move freely around Shanghai City and Jiangsu and Zhejiang provinces for up to six days. Up until August 20th, 175,000 people had applied under the 144 policy through Shanghai Customs. The number has been growing by 20 to 30 percent over the past three years. This means that more and more foreign visitors are enjoying the convenience brought by the policy. The policy is tailor-made for the convenience of business travelers. An initial wave of visitors made use of it during the 2018 China International Import Expo. But the new policy proved uniquely helpful for Shanghai Zhangjiang Biobank. Set up in 2017, it's one of the biggest facilities of its kind in China, storing millions of biosamples at ultra-low temperatures. It can store up to 100,000 biosamples at minus 80 degrees Celsius. That it maintains efficiency and security in operating is decisive to the safety of our samples. In 2018, this vital piece of equipment suffered a critical failure. If the low temperature environment couldn't be maintained, the Vito biosamples would be irreparably damaged at a huge financial cost. The equipment had been imported and only qualified technicians from the manufacturer could solve the problem. Time was critical.
This couldn't drag on for over 24 hours. We wouldn't make it in time if we followed the regular visa process for our French engineer. So we took advantage of the 144-hour policy and solved this problem overnight. The crisis was averted. Like Shanghai, several other major gateway cities such as Beijing, Tianjin, Wuhan and Chengdu have also enacted similar visa-free policies. We are a global community. We have one planet where we face global challenges uh, and that we need global solutions. It's really important that people uh, do exchange with each other uh, and that they do understand the lives, the realities of different people around the world. So I think people-to-people -people exchange is very important. In the northeastern city of Daqing, an international snooker tournament is being held. With a prize pot of 800,000 British pounds, most of the world's top 16 players have come here for snooker's international championship. The, the winner's prize is huge. Anybody that wins the tournament here this week is going to be very happy, you know, £175,000, a hell of a lot of money. Uh, we're all very grateful for the opportunities that the competitions in China gives us. Yeah, it's good. It's good for the game because obviously there's four or five tournaments out in China, so it's, it's, it's good for the sponsors as well. Um, and yeah, it's a worldwide sport, so obviously there's a lot of Chinese and, and if you're good enough, you'll be on the main tour. 19-year-old Yan Bingtao, 18th in the world ranking, is one of the rising stars of world snooker. He's one of the hottest contenders for the champion. Two years ago, he defeated star players Ronnie O'Sullivan and John Higgins at this exact tournament. Yan Bingtao's career in snooker started five years ago when he flew to London alone in pursuit of becoming a pro player. In the second half of each year, I travel backwards and forwards between China and the UK. Sometimes I even traveled back and forth twice in one month. But today, as more and more young aspiring Chinese players join the game, Pro snooker athletes from China now account for a fifth of all contestants across tournaments. Young stars like Yan Bingtao and Zhou Yuelong won world championships in their teams. Also, we have a number of young players from 15 to 18. These players are working their ways to represent China on major professional snooker tournaments worldwide. There are more and more snooker matches in China too, and international players are getting used to coming to China a few times a year to play. This is the fifth year the little-known oil town of Daqing has hosted the international championship. The tournament is helping the city shake off its image as an old industrial base. Snooker fans from around the world have flocked here for the tournament. Today, Four world-class tournaments are held in China every year, offering prize money that's among the highest in the snooker world. The country is quickly becoming a major center of this traditionally English sport. China's output in equipment, technologies and talents have laid a very good foundation for the development of world snooker. Today, Britain is holding on tight with the top spot. All the top players are British, but I think this will change in five to ten years. More and more people will challenge their positions. The winner is Britain's Judd Trump. He takes home £175,000. Yan has little time to overcome his disappointment. He has to get back to his busy practice and competition schedule. With more wealth and a newfound love of snooker, many Chinese parents are sending their children abroad for coaching. This has helped to raise the level of snooker in China. The situation is similar for many other sports, including golf, tennis, 
and ice hockey. More Chinese players are entering the list of top players and more international tournaments are being held in China every year. Yan is preparing for the next tournament. It means a return to his high-flying lifestyle. Some 46 kilometers south of Tiananmen Square in the heart of Beijing, construction has been completed of the newest and biggest airport in China, Beijing Daxing International Airport. It opened its doors to the first wave of travelers at the end of September 2019. This massive, futuristic 11 billion US dollar project took 1,200 days to complete. It's expected to handle 72 million passengers a year by 2025. And so, as China opens its doors wider and its people enjoy greater freedom of movement, it's striding towards a future of unprecedented integration with the world.